Hello, everyone, and welcome to Managing a Crisis Post-COVID, a Stronger Crisis Response and Management System with Dr. Arnold Howitt. My name is Jill Felicio, and I am an ALB class of 2000 and ALM class of 2013 Harvard Extension School grad, as well as the Director of Advancement here. I am delighted to welcome you tonight, and I do so alongside our alumni leadership of the HEAA Midwest chapter. This incredible group worked so hard to bring this timely and urgent event to you, and I cannot thank them enough. Now, as we get underway, I just wanna mention a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Feel free to use the chat box to say hello from wherever you are in the world and use the Q&A box for any questions that you wish to pose during tonight's recorded presentation. We will leave as much time as possible to address your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Now, in recent months, the news has been filled with natural and man-made disasters in the United States and elsewhere. Not only the global pandemic of COVID-19, but the catastrophic wildfires in the American West, severe flooding in Europe and in China, tornadoes in the U.S. heartland. But we are so very fortunate to have Dr. Howitt with us this evening to help make sense of the health and emergency management systems that are necessary to cope and hopefully abate these and future disasters. Now, Dr. Howitt has been faculty member and administrator at Harvard since 1976. But more importantly, he has taught at Harvard Extension School pretty much every semester since 1980. He received Harvard Extension School's Joanne Fussa Award for Distinguished Teaching in 1993. And his latest course, Crisis Management and Emergency Preparedness, begins on January 24th of 2022. Now, he is based at the JFK School of Government here at Harvard and is the founder and co-director of the Program on Crisis Leadership, which conducts research and leads executive education programs for senior practitioners worldwide. Now, in recent years, Dr. Howitt has written on crisis management and communication during the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2019 Notre Dame Cathedral Fire, medical management of mass casualty events, and Nepal's 2015 earthquakes. Now, he has written and edited several notable books, including Public Health Preparedness, Natural Disaster Management in the Asia Pacific, Managing Crises, and Countering Terrorism. So without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Arnold Howitt. Thank you very much, Jill, for that uh, generous introduction. And it's definitely my great pleasure uh, to be here tonight to be able to speak to you uh, about an important subject. Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, I uh, will have some of my former students out in the audience. Uh, but I look forward to introducing this subject to people that I haven't had the opportunity to work with in the past. Uh, let me share my screen. And uh, what I would like to be doing this uh, this evening is first of all to uh, speak about COVID uh, and place it in the context of other crises, including the ones that Joe mentioned just a minute ago uh, that are confronting society. And then I'd like to consider COVID in a more generalized way uh, as an example of uh, a true crisis uh, and characterize those crises particularly uh, by the defining feature of that category, uh, the presence of substantial novelties in the situation that uh, they're occurring in. And finally, uh, I'd like to examine what uh, the COVID crisis, uh, along with some of the other things that we're facing, uh, implies about how we should prepare for the future, uh, for the crises and disasters that we may encounter uh, in those at that time. Uh, COVID has certainly been a uh, serious uh, and severe crisis. Uh, worldwide, uh, we've had almost a quarter of a billion uh, total cases in the world. Um, uh, above four and a half million people worldwide have died from COVID. Uh, and now with the vaccination uh, regime in place, we have uh, given about 
six billion doses of uh, a vaccine of various types around the world. Uh, in the United States, we've had uh, about 42 million cases. So uh, perhaps one in every eight or nine Americans has uh, had a confirmed case and no doubt many others have had cases that they're not aware of. Uh, the deaths from COVID uh, have now exceeded the deaths, uh, the estimated deaths from the 1918 um, uh, Spanish flu epidemic. Uh, and uh, just this past week, uh, we reached a terrible milestone that one out of every 500 Americans has died uh, of COVID. Uh, worldwide, uh, this map shows uh, where the hotspots uh, of uh, COVID outbreak are at the current time. And you can see that the United States is one of those uh, hotspots. Uh, so COVID is clearly a crisis, uh, but the world also faces other crises. Uh, Jill mentioned the catastrophic fires that are occurring in California, but also in Turkey, in Siberia, in Greece, and a number of other countries. Uh, the flooding that occurred in Germany and Belgium this summer uh, was quite severe uh, and uh, caused uh, immense hardship among the people who were affected by it. Uh, uh, only a year or so ago, uh, there was a horrible uh, uh, explosion of hazardous materials that had been uh, illegally stored uh, in, in very large quantities uh, in the port in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, and that uh, explosion destroyed large parts of the port and also uh, apartment buildings and dwellings uh, in a very large section of uh, the city of Beirut. Um, those are individual crises though, and we can really think about several kinds of crises that we can characterize by type. Uh, so of course we have public health crises uh, of infectious diseases, uh, but we could also include bioterrorism like the attacks of anthrax in 2001 in the United States. Uh, natural disasters of course often cause uh, crises, uh, a range of uh, of uh, natural disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, floods, or earthquakes. Uh, we also uh, are frequently uh, encountering uh, technology, infrastructure, and systems failures. Uh, and that might include uh, the industrial accidents like the uh, explosion in Beirut, uh, transportation crashes, uh, oil spills like the Gulf of Mexico, uh, BP oil spill, uh, and most recently the ransomware uh, cyber attacks, uh, terrorism and civil disorder uh, create crises. Uh, and finally, uh, we experience chronic or long-term emergencies that uh, are not acute in the same way that the uh, previous ones I mentioned, uh, but certainly have uh, severe impacts on the people who are affected. Uh, drought, famine, uh, civil strife, and countries that are divided and uh, uh, having a civil war or terrorist attacks, uh, and quite importantly for our future climate change impacts. So I want uh, to think then uh, more generally before returning to the specifics of preparing for uh, infectious disease outbreaks and other kinds of crises uh, by asking what uh, the defining characteristic of a crisis are. And uh, in doing this, I'd like to differentiate uh, crises, and I put them in quotation marks because I'll present you a uh, particular definition of crisis that I've uh, developed with my uh, research and teaching colleague, uh, Professor Dutch Leonard, who teaches at uh, both the Kennedy School and the Business School. Uh, so I'd like to ask what differentiates a crisis uh, from what uh, Professor Leonard and I have called routine emergencies. Um, and more than that, uh, because I think this is not uh, purely an academic distinction, why does it matter that there's a difference between crises and routine emergencies? So we can think about a continuum of uh, conditions that exist in any kind of uh, community. Uh, there's normal operations of uh, the highway system, of uh, transportation systems, water being supplied through uh, 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 water delivery systems, uh, sewer systems, a whole range of physical and human service uh, uh, 
activities. And sometimes those encounter minor operating problems, but we don't really think of those. There might be a, an accident on the highway or there might be a, a, a power outage because of a storm. Uh, we don't think of those as crises. But then as we move further down this continuum, uh, we do enter the range of emergencies uh, and we uh, encounter what uh, Professor Leonard and I call routine emergencies. And the characteristics of routine emergencies, I think, are quite uh, straightforward. Uh, they're sudden and uh, typically not planned. Uh, they often have high stakes uh, that uh, or at least uh, cause damage. Uh, there's a certain amount of urgency to them. Uh, and quite importantly, uh, there uh, are contingency factors that outcomes are going to vary uh, depending on what kinds of plans have been in place, the decisions made at the moment of the emergency, and what actions are taken subsequently. So what, what defines these uh, emergencies, though, as routine in the uh, terminology that uh, I use, is that these are emergencies that can be anticipated. Uh, they're recurrent uh, kinds of uh, situations. Um, and we can uh, expect them to occur periodically, uh, at least in terms of their general characteristics, even when we can't predict exactly where they're going to happen or what the timing would be of their appearance. Um, uh, one might think that the term routine implies that uh, these emergencies are small, and perhaps that's an infelicitous uh, uh, terminology that we've chosen. Um, but by routine emergencies actually could be either small or relatively large. So the first picture here is of a highway accident. Uh, uh, perhaps a few people were injured. Obviously the uh, railings were damaged, uh, uh, several vehicles were damaged and a variety of uh, emergency vehicles, police, fire, tow trucks, uh, ambulances are on, the, are on the scene. On the other hand, on the right side, uh, we can see a pretty large emergency, uh, a forest fire. And it is certainly the case that some of the very large forest fires that we've been experiencing qualify as crises. But the United States has about 10,000 fires that uh, arise in forests every year. And of those, several dozens uh, are quite large and often need hundreds or even thousands of firefighters uh, to put them out. And uh, they have developed uh, standard ways of dealing with that. Uh, the firefighters have developed skills uh, and what looks like a horrible emergency for the people who are potentially threatened by those emergencies, uh, in fact, turns out to be uh, for them something that is, uh, if not ordinary, at least something that they're well prepared for uh, and are able to uh, uh, respond to quite uh, deliberately. And so in terms of thinking about this category of routine emergencies, uh, what counts is whether the responders can forecast them by type, and certainly forest fires, uh, even though we don't know where they'll break out, are an annual occurrence. Uh, and because they can plan for them, uh, they can uh, prepare for their equipment and personnel. Uh, those people can practice the things that they need to do when they're confronting a real fire. Uh, and over time, the people uh, who pursue this as a profession uh, gain experience by fighting uh, fires in repeated instances uh, and therefore acquire a good deal of skill in doing it. So this routine characteristic is the ability uh, to uh, anticipate uh, and as a result of that to prepare and get experience. So what do we think of uh, as excellent performance in preparing for routine emergencies? Uh, well, it includes having a good set of contingency plans. What would we do if this kind of event occurs? How many people do we need? What kind of equipment, et cetera? Uh, having clarity about the goals and priorities that we might be pursuing. Uh, uh, in, in the firefighting business, it's saving lives. Uh, and only then protecting property uh, uh, and environmentally sensitive areas, uh, and finally doing that in a way that doesn't unnecessarily endanger the lives of the responders who are fighting the fires. 
Um, preparedness also means having the right resources in place and an organizational structure. People are obviously a critical part of this, and uh, they're uh, in terms of the professions uh, that deal with emergencies like firefighters or public health officials or police officers or emergency medical personnel or people in the National Guard and uh, other kinds of professions. Uh, there's a process of recruitment and selection so that the people who enter the professions uh, have certain qualifications. They go through training. Uh, over time, they develop skills. Uh, these organizations regularly have drills and exercises so that people can practice what they've done, what they've learned, and uh, what they need to do. Uh, and finally, there's real operational experience that as they respond uh, to various emergencies that occur over time, uh, they gain that experience and skills. And so in these organizations, uh, there's uh, this whole process, the sequence of things that I've sketched here, uh, develop expertise in the people who are uh, involved in it. And on the other hand, the uh, organization through uh, these activities, um, and particularly their experiences, uh, are able to learn lessons and apply those uh, both to the uh, early stages of the process for new members, uh, but also to uh, uh, the uh, a working knowledge of the people who uh, uh, have much more experience in those uh, organizations. So excellence in preparing for routine emergencies uh, is in fact a critically important thing for society to be able to do. Um, and that's uh, uh, in large part because these routine emergencies amount to the very large majority of the dangerous situations that emergency managers deal with. Uh, routine emergencies, I, we don't have any good count of it, but almost certainly account for 95, 98% of the things that emergency responders do. Uh, ambulance calls for people with a heart attack, uh, firefighters going out to deal with a, a car that has caught fire, uh, police officers uh, dealing with uh, uh, a robbery in a, in a uh, convenience store. These are all routine emergencies for these people. And even the very large ones, uh, say in the policing, a drug bust that might involve 20 officers uh, for at least the leaders of those uh, uh, efforts. Uh, these are things that they've done in the past that they have plans for and that they're ready for. Uh, but crises, uh, as I'll uh, talk about them in a minute, create very different kinds of demands on the emergency responders than the uh, routine emergencies I've just been talking about. Um, so here we're placing crises on that continuum I talked about a, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and uh, the features of a crisis have some important similarities to those of a routine emergency. And you can see that these, that this list is uh, identical to what I, I offered a minute ago. Um, but what's critically different is that um, crises involve significant elements of novelty. Now, what exactly do I mean by novelty? Uh, well, it, novelty can arise in an emergency situation in several ways. Uh, obviously, the most uh, uh, straightforward is that there's something new under the sun, something that we've never before seen and that the responders uh, have not got any experience with. And uh, certainly one of the examples that's foremost in our minds, I would think, is uh, an emergent infectious disease like COVID, uh, which, as we all know, has uh, had characteristics that have baffled uh, uh, the medical profession and the scientists as they've learned more and more about COVID. So brand new experiences uh, create novelty. A second possibility, though, could be a familiar emergency that is of extraordinary scale. Uh, something that is much, much larger than the plans that we have and the resources that we have in place for managing it. Um, and so an example of this that we're all familiar with these days is the overload of hospital facilities uh, under the press of uh, COVID patients who are desperately ill, uh, filling up uh, intensive care wards, uh, requiring uh, hospitals in a number of states uh, to postpone uh, certainly elective surgeries, but even some more uh, urgent kinds of surgery 
uh, because of this uh, large scale of the uh, number of people who are seeking hospital help. And that can create a crisis as well. And a third possibility is a combination of emergencies uh, that no one really expected to occur together, uh, but that cause complications in uh, the response. So one example of this would be um, evacuation from hurricanes uh, during a time when there is a virus like COVID rampant in the community. <coughs> and that means that the uh, individuals uh, who are responding as well as people uh, who have left their homes and are seeking uh, shelter uh, in gymnasiums or other places where they might be uh, uh, housed temporarily uh, will have a hard time maintaining social distancing, masking, uh, and a variety of other protections against COVID. Uh, so these, when these two things occur together, it creates uh, unusual uh, strain on the system. Um, <laughs> we can distinguish, I think, two specific types of crises that vary in some important ways. Uh, one are sudden crises. And here's an example from uh, recent history, uh, the earthquake, uh, tsunami, and uh, nuclear accident that occurred in Japan uh, in March of 2011. Um, the earthquake occurred the uh, suddenly and uh, with no expectations uh, as to when it was going to happen. Uh, it caused a tsunami which uh, uh, started offshore but hit the uh, coastline of Japan within 30 to 45 minutes, depending on where it was. Uh, it caused fires like the one that's depicted on the right at a refinery. Um, and probably most importantly, it uh, caused uh, an a nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Uh, so this is an example both of a sudden crisis that happened not quite instantaneously, but extremely fast. Uh, and also an example of a complex combination uh, of um, emergencies, like the smaller example I gave of hurricane evacuation during a COVID e epidemic. Suddenly, uh, the people in Japan had to deal with three quite different uh, crises all at the same time. The second type of uh, crisis is an emergent crisis, one that happens much more slowly. Uh, and the coronavirus uh, epidemic could be uh, regarded as an example of that. Um, and um, we can sort of place all of this in perspective um, with this graph, which shows on the uh, x-axis simply the passage of time and on the y-axis uh, the uh, severity of the consequences of the event. Um, and as I noted, we have normal operations, which go up and down a little bit, uh, routine emergencies. Uh, typically have a spurt of danger uh, or of at least inconvenience like a power outage, uh, but eventually uh, responders uh, who are quite ready for these types of events are able to get control of them and uh, be able to reduce them. Uh, a sudden crisis by contrast, uh, like the uh, uh, epidemic at, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear accident um, have severe consequences immediately. Uh, and as a result of that, almost instantaneously uh, get very senior officials in government, uh, companies and others uh, alerted that there's something going on and mobilized to try to respond as well as they can to that crisis. Although they may be stymied by what they should do, they're at least aware of it. By contrast, uh, emergent crises are quite problematic. Uh, as the yellow line there start, uh, shows, they start out looking more or less like a routine emergency. And so COVID, for example, uh, as it appeared in China and as it uh, began to appear in the United States shortly after, uh, COVID looked a lot like ordinary respiratory diseases, pneumonia or uh, seasonal flu. And uh, while some physicians were a little startled by it and wondered whether it was exactly what they thought, nonetheless, they, uh, the vast majority of the health system in the early stages 
uh, treated as a routine as a routine emergency uh, that they'd seen many, many times before, people with respiratory problems. But at some point, uh, uh, emergent crises become obviously different from what they were before, uh, what people thought they were, and they take off into uh, in the direction of uh, uh, crises. Uh, but some, in some cases, there is a delay in recognizing that these are uh, genuine crises. And people may think that they're on the path of routine emergencies when they actually are engaged in uh, emergent crisis. And we know, for example, that uh, President Trump downplayed the severity of COVID uh, in the early days. In Brazil, President Bolsonaro called it a little flu. Uh, and underestimating uh, how serious a uh, potential crisis is that is slowly emerging uh, uh, can result in uh, even worse problems uh, because it gets out of control. So the um, implications of novelty, I think, are quite important and, uh, and uh, significantly uh, different from what occurs in routine emergencies. So what flows from this idea of novelty? Well, first, there's really great uncertainty and very low awareness of what's going on. Certainly what we saw, the poor situational awareness in the early days of the COVID crisis, uh, not knowing what it was at first, then not knowing how severe it was, uh, not realizing it was rampant in the community, even though only a few cases were being diagnosed. Uh, and uh, over a much longer period, we've had tremendous uncertainty about a number of aspects, medical aspects um, and uh, epidemiological aspects of the COVID crisis. That tends, that is partly the result of the fact that when we're confronting something new, frequently nobody involved, even uh, experienced emergency responders or medical professionals or public health people, nobody is an expert on all aspects of these crises. Uh, it produces fear and high stress for the people that are involved and also the people who are experiencing it. Uh, there's a sense that things are out of control. Um, it's clearly beyond the normal operational capacities. Uh, in this instance of COVID, of public health, of the uh, healthcare professionals who are dealing with people. Uh, and quite importantly, uh, in crisis situations, almost always there's no single organization that has been designed to deal with something that is so far out of the ordinary. Uh, and it requires that different organizational organizations collaborate with each other uh, and pool their resources and skills uh, to be able to uh, respond to something that no one has seen before. Uh, because it's novel, there's no comprehensive plan that's been put in place ahead of time. Uh, there may be some elements of existing plans that are useful, uh, but there also will be elements that uh, were not planned for and that will create uh, problems that hadn't been anticipated. Uh, uh, by contrast with routine emergencies, there's um, no standard operating procedures that uh, can be automatically put in place. There's no checklist that people can follow. Uh, and it may be that even some of the predetermined actions that people have made will prove insufficient or counterproductive. And we've seen that, especially with the Delta variant of uh, COVID uh, being much more um, contagious than many people uh, expected. Uh, and some of the precautions that we put in place didn't work, for, haven't worked very well in dealing with the Delta variant. Uh, often uh, in these situations, we need to work out goals and priorities uh, because we hadn't thought about the kinds of issues that arise. Uh, and certainly the COVID crisis gives us an example of that, or many examples of that. Uh, it isn't just a medical crisis uh, because the response has required uh, curtailing many ac uh, economic activities. Uh, and as a result, there's a clash between the need for people to have income uh, and uh, to protect themselves from disease. Uh, 
We also have had the uh, unanticipated effect of interrupting uh, the uh, educations of people from uh, uh, preschool through graduate schools. Um, and all these uh, uh, priorities uh, compete uh, and different people may have different takes on what order they should be, how they should be uh, reconciled with each other. And together that uh, creates the potential uh, either for policy disagreements uh, or even political conflict, which certainly in the United States we're experiencing over the right way to respond to COVID. So does this list, which is a generalizable list, and I've been illustrating with some uh, experiences with COVID, does this sound like what we've been experiencing uh, during the last uh, 20 months or so? I think the answer is yes, and that um, uh, there are some uh, particular aspects, however, of infectious disease outbreaks like COVID uh, that make it the novelty of, a, of an outbreak like this distinctive. Uh, one is the invisibility of the threat. We can't see the virus. Uh, we can't see the uh, aerosolized uh, viruses that are floating uh, and that might endanger us. Uh, there's an extended time frame uh, for this epidemic, uh, and many infectious disease outbreaks have such an extended time frame. Uh, even a forest fire, which might last for several months, uh, does not have the staying power that we've experienced over the last 20 months, uh, uh, extending out into the future for some uh, uncertain amount of time. Uh, in infectious disease outbreaks, there's a risk for the community at large. There's not a well-defined uh, group of people who uh, live in a certain place that is threatened, uh, but instead everybody is threatened. Uh, that comes from the fact that disease is geo-extensive, uh, and uh, there's a possible leapfrog effect, uh, including internationally, uh, caused by modern transportation. And we're pretty certain that uh, the United States received infections from, uh, of COVID uh, from uh, both uh, Asia, probably China, and also from Europe. Uh, in each case, uh, people transported by um, uh, intercontinental uh, air travel. Um, not only does uh, uh, an infectious disease outbreak cover a large amount of territory, but it also cuts across the boundaries, political boundaries, um, and potentially many, many jurisdictions are affected. Uh, and we've seen some of the difficulties that this has caused for governance. Uh, as different states have different policies, the federal government has a different set of, sometimes a different set of recommended actions that should be taken. Uh, and in a federal system like the United States or Germany or Australia, uh, subunits of government like states have a good deal of independence and can decide to do things that are different from what their peers are doing. A key feature of an emergent infectious disease, in other words, a new disease that shows up for the first time rather than an outbreak of a disease that we've known uh, before, um, an effect of emergent diseases is the creation of substantial scientific uncertainty. And unfortunately, we've read about this virtually on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in the newspapers and social media and other, uh, other elements. Um, and the result of that is because our knowledge is evolving uh, as the uh, crisis itself develops, uh, it's difficult to establish a sense of exactly what's going on. Um, and perhaps even more importantly, it's uh, very, very difficult uh, to communicate with the public what they should do because um, scientists and medical professionals are uh, learning more about what's going on almost on a daily basis and uh, certainly on a month-to-month -month basis uh, and what may have seemed like sensible advice uh, at one point in time may suddenly be discovered to either be irrelevant or erroneous uh, and something else needs to be done. So I've spent a lot of time so far talking about um, both the um, current crises we're facing, but also uh, trying to put those in a larger perspective and 
I'll speak about what's distinctive about uh, routine emergencies as opposed to crises. Uh, in fact, there are two very different styles of response and leadership um, that these two different kinds of uh, 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 emergencies uh, evoke. And it is important for us to be able to uh, separate these kinds of situations uh, because we don't want to be dealing with something that's brand new that has um, uh, unexpected uh, characteristics, uh, expecting on that the things that are tried and true responses to things that we've seen over and over again, the anticipatable routine emergencies, um, that those uh, that these features apply. And so for routine emergencies, um, as we talked about it, uh, already, um, we develop contingency plans, we try to professionalize the people who are going to deal with these things. Uh, we standardize uh, the response procedures, people who lead the organizations that are dealing with these uh, emergencies uh, usually reach their positions uh, because they have uh, uh, expertise and, and therefore are chosen for leadership. And that combination of official position and uh, experience uh, and expertise gives them a, a strong authority. And we wind up with hierarchical command structures in these kinds of organizations. And we aim for precise execution. Uh, we've all seen TV shows where people uh, about hospital emergency rooms, and we've all seen what happens when somebody shows up, comes in with an ambulance, uh, having a heart attack. Uh, there's a well-prepared uh, so-called code blue that's put into effect. And I, people know what their roles are. They know what kind of equipment they need. Uh, they have the right facilities available for it. And the aim in dealing with a, a, an expected uh, kind of emergency of that sort is to be able to execute the plans uh, and use the skills that they have in as precise a fashion as possible. On the other hand, uh, crises have a different characteristic. Um, we simply don't have the plans in place uh, or that to the extent that we have any plans that are relevant, um, they uh, do not necessarily uh, work for the uh, situations that we're facing. Again, COVID is a good example of that. And therefore, they, these plans have to be substantially adapted as the crisis develops. Uh, and that adaptation may go on uh, repeatedly over the course of a, uh, an extended duration crisis like COVID. Um, nobody is an expert in dealing with these crises. There's an incompletely specified skill set. Uh, and even the uh, top scientists in various agencies like uh, CDC and FDA uh, or the National Institutes of Health, uh, or on the other hand, um, in uh, 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 pharmaceutical companies uh, or practitioners who have a great deal of experience. Uh, no one is the is the expert on this, uh, and it requires pooling skills, pooling and um, uh, uh, insights uh, in order to be able to uh, deal with it. Uh, in doing so, there's a great deal of improvisation and invention uh, that are uh, engaged in. It's not the implementation of standard operating procedures. It is trying to figure out what works in a, and often in a trial and error fashion. And leadership here is not so much based on uh, expertise, but rather on how well people are able to cope with the unexpected uh, and lead other people in dealing with that. Uh, and here we also, um, uh, on the one hand, don't want to have a hierarchy when we're trying to collect information. We want to be open to getting that information from a very wide range of sources uh, to make sure that we're not omitting insights or uh, data that would help us uh, formulate better courses of action. Uh, but when we want to, when we know what we're going to do in a given stage, uh, we probably become more directive in the implementation process. Because of this, of all of these things that I've mentioned for crises, uh, it's probably appropriate to be fault tolerant uh, in examining how people do. 
mistakes will be made, things that we've tried will not necessarily work. And uh, as a result, uh, we, should, we ought to be cautious in assigning blame uh, at the same time that we need to uh, hold people accountable, uh, which is a tricky business, uh, but we certainly can't expect uh, the kind of precise ex execution uh, that at least is the uh, ideal aim in a routine emergency. So where are we in uh, our, um, uh, uh, what we're facing in the future uh, for the kinds of crises that I've been identifying? And I think that uh, it's becoming very clear that in the 21st century, uh, the major disasters uh, are in fact becoming more frequent, uh, they're much more intense, uh, and they're a, a much greater threat to society uh, than some of the disasters that we've experienced in the past. So why is that the case? I think there's several explanations for it, perhaps even more than the four that I'm going to cite. Uh, one is simply that we have increasingly large concentrated populations and more and more of them are located in areas of substantial risk uh, along coastlines or in areas that are uh, seismically active uh, or in other settings that uh, along uh, bodies of water that might flood, et cetera. Uh, secondly, uh, our human systems uh, have become increasingly complex and interconnected. Uh, and uh, uh, the supply chains for goods are complicated. They tend to be international. Uh, they are um, vulnerable to disruption uh, and they are vulnerable to unexpected disruptions. About 10 years ago, there was very severe flooding in the Bangkok, Thailand area, and uh, uh, it got a great deal of newspaper coverage. But what people did not um, sense at the time was that this was going, this, these floods in Bangkok uh, were going to have immense impacts on China, Japan, and the United States, and particularly the uh, computer industries in those countries, because it turned out that the factories in the Bangkok area that were put out of commission uh, produced a very high percentage of the uh, disk drives that were needed for personal computers and other computers. Uh, and as a result of shortages of disk drives, uh, computer companies in those three developed countries uh, were unable to supply people who wanted uh, them. And we're seeing a similar disruption from COVID of the um, semiconductor production uh, and uh, therefore uh, impacts on the production of new automobiles uh, and the uh, 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 st stocking up of automobiles for uh, the uh, rental car business. Uh, another factor is our technology risks. Uh, the nuclear accident that I described in uh, uh, Japan is obviously uh, a severe example of this, uh, but certainly are increasing dependent on dependence on um, information systems and, uh, and uh, computerized uh, manufacturing and other things mean uh, that um, when there are uh, ransomware attacks or when uh, systems go out for uh, accidental reasons, uh, that those uh, technology risks are um, severe. Uh, and if they occur during uh, um, a natural disaster, they can cause immense difficulties and danger for populations. And finally, climate change uh, uh, threatens to increase the frequency and intensity of these kinds of disasters. Um, one example of this is the impact that climate change has on hurricanes. Um, and we saw, ex uh, uh, examples of that with Hurricane Ida uh, that just uh, occurred a month or so ago. Uh, and an earlier example was Hurricane Harvey in the Houston area in 2017. Um, uh, climate change has a number of impacts on hurricanes. Uh, winds become stronger and more intense. Uh, uh, there's more rain because uh, warmer air holds more water. Uh, the storms move more slowly, which means that a given geographic area is subjected to much more rainfall than it would have been if the storm moved faster. Um, these storms range much more widely geographically. 
uh, and uh, uh, come to threaten areas that only infrequently have seen these kinds of storms. Hurricane Ida, obviously, uh, although it first threatened the American Southeast, uh, caused its worst damage in the New York, New Jersey area uh, and uh, areas that very infrequently see hurricanes. Uh, and finally, um, uh, there's much more volatility in these storms. They intensify more rapidly and uh, they give much less warning uh, to vulnerable areas uh, in the American uh, Southeast, uh, uh, in the New Orleans area and others. Uh, it proved impossible to uh, evacuate nursing homes and other places that might have been at risk uh, because the storm formed so fast and became intense so fast uh, that it didn't leave the lead time that was needed uh, for the very sensitive kinds of evacuation measures uh, involved in that. Um, in uh, these kinds of events can have cascading impacts. Uh, one thing affects another. It's a lot like uh, uh, a game of billiards where one ball bounces off the others. Uh, and uh, these kinds of impacts can uh, cascade from uh, one uh, element of, the, of society to another. Uh, and modern societies, uh, because of the very close coupling of their systems uh, are very much uh, subject to these uh, kinds of impacts of uh, one thing uh, affecting another. Uh, we also are likely to be seeing many more uh, concurrent crises uh, like the ones that I've mentioned uh, in uh, situations where uh, we have more than one thing happening uh, and at a time when uh, we have heightened danger from natural disasters and uh, much more complex technologies that we're dependent on, uh, uh, as well as uh, the possibilities of pandemic disease, we're likely to see many more examples of these concurrent crises. Uh, I won't uh, belabor this, but uh, two examples would be, for example, for uh, uh, wildland firefighting, uh, the forest fires we're seeing uh, requires uh, changing the way uh, the uh, forest firefighters, who may number in the thousands, are accommodated and the way that they work, how they're grouped into teams and what they do, uh, and creates uh, additional things that have to be taken care of in order uh, to minimize the chances that the firefighters will uh, contract COVID uh, while they're trying to deal with the fire. Uh, similarly, I mentioned earlier some of the problems that arise in trying to evacuate and shelter people uh, during a COVID uh, epidemic, uh, especially when we're putting them into fairly large scale places uh, that um, in which social distancing is very difficult. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, when we have these kinds of situations, whether they're uh, individual crises or concurrent crises, uh, that these kinds of events tend to be hardest on vulnerable population, women's, women, children, uh, low-income families that may lack transportation or secure housing, people who are institutionalized in hospitals or prisons or uh, mental hospitals, uh, people who are disabled and confined to wheelchairs or other uh, 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 restrictions on their mobility, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, senior citizens, non-native speakers, and undocumented immigrants. And in constructing a system uh, that tries to protect the population, we have to be particularly worried about these um, uh, extremely vulnerable uh, population groups. So all of this creates tremendous challenges for crisis preparedness in the future. Uh, I've described a uh, uh, decision-making environment, and we've seen this if we read the uh, newspapers about COVID, uh, dynamic system situations that are constantly evolving, uh, poorly defined issues, competing goals and priorities, uh, a stream of decisions that have to be made by senior leaders uh, in real time, often highly pressed uh, by the need to make these decisions quickly, uh, the need to pool the resources and the wisdom of multiple organizations uh, in order to figure out how to go, go forward because we don't have single organizations that have all the pieces that they would need. Um, 
but still we may be even doing that pooling, we may be lacking some of the uh, skills and uh, processes and resources that we need. Um, and the result is that these situations feel very frightening and chaotic. Um, importantly, I think uh, it, it is necessary to recognize that these kinds of uh, situations are, are not simply for the emergency management system, the standard first responder organizations like police, fire, uh, uh, EMS, uh, or the somewhat expanded set of first responders, public health increasingly playing that role, uh, or even uh, um, a few others like the National Guard or whatever. Um, it also includes agencies that we don't think of as uh, as uh, first response organizations, but may have resources that are critical. Uh, transportation agencies that can take people where they need to go, public works agencies that have construction equipment, etc. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, we need to be thinking much more, not, a, not only about the plans for individual uh, institutions, uh, say uh, the police department or the fire department, uh, but plans that uh, go across agency responsibilities. We need to have exercises that involve those people um, and we need to get their senior personnel to establish working relationships so they're not doing what uh, emergency management people think is the worst case situation, which is uh, exchanging business cards with your colleagues on the first day uh, or the outset of a, uh, a major emergency. Uh, having those personal relationships is uh, often a critical uh, and extremely useful fact uh, of life. Um, the need for that collaboration, I think, is uh, clear uh, in this notional example. This is obviously not a precise statement, but we have the challenge of any uh, emergency uh, and the expertise that's needed to deal with it. Uh, and as you can see from this graph, it start, those things start out being separated and the expertise is perhaps not completely sufficient to deal with the challenge, but over time it starts to converge and uh, respond effectively to the challenge. Um, COVID though has spread out uh, that challenge uh, and in some sense uh, given us experts with diminished expertise uh, because they've never seen these uh, these events before. Uh, and the result of that is that we need to uh, involve uh, many different people with uh, different uh, streams of knowledge and professional experience uh, in order to uh, uh, pool their resources and their uh, uh, thoughtfulness in order to find our way forward in these kinds of events. Uh, this graph shows uh, COVID-19, but you could think of this as any uh, major crisis that is uh, you know, far out of the box, like the experience that Japan had uh, with its uh, crisis or that the United States experienced uh, with the oil spill of the, B and the continuous oil spill of the BP offshore oil platform uh, and the pollution of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, these kinds of situations are simply not amenable to the expertise of any single organization. So the question is, are we ready? And I think uh, in answering that, we need to think about how we prepare ourselves for risk. So there is really a standard risk management paradigm, which you may have seen, uh, and we can think of a distribution of, uh, of risks or hazards uh, along two dimensions. One would be how bad the consequences would be, and the other how frequently these things would uh, occur. And the, the risk management paradigm says, first of all, that we want to identify these risks. So we want to attach names to what these things are. Uh, we want to analyze their uh, probable consequences uh, and certainly be worried about the ones that have the uh, most severe consequences. Uh, and then we choose ways of managing these risks that we've identified. It might be prevention. Uh, it might be doing things to mitigate, namely to minimize the uh, impact that they have. Perhaps we will transfer risk, which is what insurance is about. Uh, many, many people pool their resources and then the ones that need it uh, when an, uh, an accident or emergency occurs are able to get um, uh, support. 
uh, or sometimes we just accept risks. We simply say, we know this could be a risk, uh, we're willing to bear it, uh, and if, uh, if it happens, then we will accept the consequences or deal with them when we see it. Um, and this risk management strategy has many benefits. Uh, and we can, uh, uh, it essentially is preparing for anticipatable risks because notice the first stage is identifying risks. So we have to be aware of them in advance. Uh, and so these anticipatable risks uh, are, are definitely worth uh, dealing with. And any number of examples like the ones that I've put here that you can read, I'm gonna uh, go a little faster, uh, make this endeavor worthwhile and they pay real benefits to society. But those things are not enough. And we get an idea of that by thinking about this risk management uh, model from a slightly different uh, perspective, namely, how much do we know about the consequences of a potential risk? Or how much do we know about the frequency with which they occur? And there's an area of, of risks that we can identify uh, where our uncertainty is very low and where we could make pretty accurate forecasts of what kinds of consequences they will have. And these are, are tractable risks and the ones that the standard risk management paradigm that I described a minute ago can handle pretty well. But then there are all these other risks out here, and this is the realm of novelty. Uh, and we can think of these as intractable risks. Um, and they're the ones that the standard risk paradigm doesn't handle very well, because that paradigm requires us to know how often they're going to happen or be able to make a pretty good estimate. And it uh, requires us to have an understanding of what kinds of consequences they will have. So think of emergent infectious disease. Three quick examples. SARS in uh, 2003, uh, a worldwide hubbub about it, uh, but ultimately only 8,000 people contracted SARS worldwide. Uh, H1N1, uh, initially in 2009 when it struck, uh, we were fearful that the early reports from Mexico of many people dying from it meant that this was going to be a, uh, a um, reprise of the uh, Spanish flu of 2000. 18, which uh, killed something like 50 million people worldwide. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, these um, uh, H1N1, uh, although it, it did have uh, bad consequences for many people, was slightly less uh, dangerous than seasonal flu, something that we're quite used to dealing with and that uh, we don't think of as a, uh, as a crisis. Um, and now we look at COVID, unpredicted, uh, and certainly the severity of it and uh, the consequences uh, were not predicted ahead of time, weren't predicted when we were several months into it, weren't predicted as recently as last summer when we thought that the uh, pandemic was waning. Uh, and now we're dealing with the consequences of the, uh, of the uh, Delta variant. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a, uh, a set of ideas associated with Donald Rumsfeld, the former uh, Secretary of Defense. Um, indeed, there was a documentary film that uh, made a great deal out of this. Uh, Rumsfeld talked about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And many people thought he was speaking gibberish. Uh, and he was even given a, uh, uh, a, uh, a satirical award for uh, uh, inventing horrible uh, neologisms in the English language. Um, but in fact, there's a good deal of sense here. And what, whatever we think of Donald Rumsfeld more globally, I think he was pretty sensible about this. Uh, there's certain things that we know about. Uh, we know about the threat and we know about what they can do. Uh, think seasonal flu, where we can make uh, uh, pretty good guesses about what the impact of that is going to be from year to year. Uh, then there are the known unknowns. Uh, there are things that we are aware of as risks, um, but the magnitude of them is something that we're not aware of, and we have a hard time estimating uh, what the, uh, what the um, uh, consequences would be, uh, just like the examples I just gave you about emergent infectious disease. So even though we know that, that uh, infectious, new infectious diseases appear uh, every once in a while, uh, and it seemed to be doing so increasingly frequently, 
uh, we have no idea what their impact is going to be, how contagious they are, how deadly, et cetera. And finally, there are the unknown unknowns. What are the threats that are out there that we can't even conceive of and where we certainly can't judge their consequences? Uh, but we know that new things do show up that we've never thought about. Uh, and uh, planning for those is, is even harder. So this area of novelty is very important to think about uh, and think about how we can do a better job of getting ready for these things, even the unknown unknowns where we might at least be able to put capacities in place that we would need in order to deal with uh, various kinds of, uh, with frequent kinds of emergencies. Um, so uh, while it's important to keep our eyes, I think, on this area of novelty, there are many ways in which uh, we, in fact, uh, discount them or are not as aware of them as we should be. And one possible reason for that is that we're to some degree captive to the fact that we're pretty successful in dealing with routine emergencies. Um, and we skew our methods of preparedness in the direction of those uh, routine emergencies. First of all, assessing risks for known dangers. Uh, so we have to be able to identify the danger to get the risk. We do contingency planning for the risks that we've identified. Again, not thinking of the novelty. Uh, we, uh, for training and exercises, we construct scenarios uh, or plans that are also based on those known risks uh, and the ones that we've identified ahead of time. Uh, and finally, we spend a lot of time, I think correctly, uh, preparing uh, after action reports, uh, trying to derive lessons learned from our past experience. Uh, that's important to apply. That's what creates the, less, the learning process that I identified early on, talking about the people who deal with routine emergencies. So I'm not denigrating the idea of learning lessons, but if we're learning a lesson, that means we've experienced something already. We've seen it before. And that means we're not pre uh, preparing for novelty. Uh, of things that we haven't seen before. Um, so society may be underprepared for these kinds of novel threats, and uh, we may be missing the chance to get ready for these things uh, uh, because we're applying our um, attention to the routine emergencies. And I think uh, the danger of that is that when we experience something that's new, that has characteristics that we've never seen before, we may try to deal with them as if they were routine emergencies. Um, and that may be insufficient, inadequate, uh, or even counterproductive in dealing with them, as uh, I think was the case with COVID as it has developed in the last two years. Um, so let me identify three general approaches to better preparedness. Uh, and um, I have a number of very specific recommendations, but I'm gonna, uh, I will save some of those for the question and answer period because I've gone on longer than I had anticipated. So what are those three gener general uh, uh, approaches? One of them is simply to make our preparation for routine emergencies better and better, to maintain that learning process, uh, to uh, do everything we can to perfect our ability to to uh, respond to those routine emergencies. Remember that I noted that uh, the vast majority, probably 95 to 98 percent of what emergency systems do is to respond to routine emergencies. Uh, they can be severe, they can threaten lives and health, and the better we can deal with those, the better off we are. Nothing I've said about and emphasizing novelty uh, ought to um, diminish the importance of preparing better continuously for routine emergencies. Another thing we can do is to identify things that um, could be emergencies um, that we may have heard about occurring in some other place or that we've read about that uh, some scientist is hypothesizing that this could happen. Uh, and uh, even though we haven't faced that in our own jurisdiction, we might, we're alerted to the things that might happen. Uh, and through that, uh, we can do um, increased risk identification, we can do planning and we can prepare if those kinds of emergencies should appear. 
And uh, for ex one example is that Harvard uh, has initiated a process to plan for uh, the possibility of flooding of its parts of its campus as a result of climate change and sea rise levels, rising sea levels. Uh, and so this is something that hasn't happened before. We don't have any experience directly with it at Harvard. Um, and yet by knowing about it um, and thinking about it, we can uh, try to make ourselves better prepared. And finally, we need to prepare for novel challenges, which is what I've been emphasizing this evening. Uh, and that requires uh, to some degree uh, uh, initiating exercises and other things that uh, will uh, pose out of the box scenarios not necessarily because those scenarios are likely to happen, uh, but because they can test us and our ability to improvise, uh, to work with people that we don't necessarily work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and through that planning process or exercise process, we can do uh, a much better job uh, if some novel experience occurs. Secondly, we can do a lot to think about the capabilities that we would want to have against uh, threats uh, that even if we can't predict exactly what it is uh, that we may have to cope with. So for example, almost many kinds of emergencies might require us to have emergency uh, feeding programs for uh, people who have, have to had to leave their homes. We might need to have emergency shelter preparations. Uh, that would be true of floods. It would be true of earthquakes. It would be true of any number of other uh, of uh, hurricanes. Um, we need emergency medical care uh, that is mobile so it can go to the scene of an emergency. Uh, and we also, in preparation for novel challenges, we also um, uh, want to work with organizations that we wouldn't ordinarily work with, uh, not only at our own level of government or within our uh, sector of NGOs or companies, uh, but work with organizations that we might have to collaborate with uh, in the future, even if we don't do that, haven't done that yet. So uh, I will identify some of the uh, general areas that uh, um, are open for, um, uh, for improvement without speaking about the specifics that I identified. And we'll make these slides available for people who are interested. Uh, we need to think about threats that affect larger geographic areas than the ones that we uh, generally plan for, not just a given city, but for a metropolitan area uh, or even a statewide area experiencing an epidemic. Uh, we need to uh, broaden the scope of organizations that prepare for emergencies, not limited just to the emergency management agencies, uh, but in fact to a variety of organizations that have resources uh, that might be helpful, uh, reaching out to the private sector as well as government. Harvard, for example, could be a partner of the city of Cambridge in the uh, state of Massachusetts uh, in responding to emergencies. Harvard has uh, medical facilities and infirmary. It has uh, many skilled um, public health and medical personnel. Uh, it has a fleet of buses. It has construction equipment. Uh, many, many resources. It has uh, dormitories. Uh, not all of which are occupied at any given moment that could be used for shelter. So there are a whole range of resources that Harvard have and, and many private sector uh, organizations, either in the corporate sector or the not-for-profit sector, uh, have resources that could be mobilized. And we should be thinking about how to do that in advance. Um, we need to strengthen institutions that are responsible for emergencies uh, and also build the kind of partnerships that I've talked about. Uh, and specifically for public health and infectious diseases, um, we need to strengthen our domestic systems of public health and healthcare, um, better infrastructure and personnel development, um, closer relationships with the emergency management system, uh, data collection and analysis capabilities, uh, stockpiles of things like personal protective gear. Uh, we have to greatly improve our ability to communicate uh, we ought to be able to bring retired uh, healthcare workers and public health professionals back into the realm of uh, helping. And we have to worry about PTSD and simple exhaustion uh, that people uh, experience when they're giving health care or dealing with public health during extended duration uh, public health crises like COVID. Uh, we have to 
may take a number of steps uh, to improve our international institutions, uh, the WHO, uh, disease surveillance systems, uh, much more transparency of information about what's going on, uh, and stronger protocols that allow uh, international teams to investigate the origins of, of um, uh, diseases. Um, and we have to do a variety of things to adapt uh, innovative technologies to deal with uh, uh, infectious disease uh, that include, uh, I think importantly, developing, uh, uh, putting a much greater emphasis on the development of therapeutic treatments for disease types. We've leaned much too heavily during COVID uh, towards uh, developing vaccines and not enough uh, towards thinking about uh, therapeutics that could help people who have contracted it. Uh, but we should build on our uh, vaccine science, uh, improve the vaccine manufacturing capacity, uh, develop much better plans for getting vaccines out to developing nations that can't uh, manufacture and distribute it on their own uh, or afford it. Uh, and we have to do a much better job of uh, developing diagnostic and contact tracing uh, apps uh, that will help to identify individuals at risk uh, so that they can take uh, precautions and uh, isolate themselves if appropriate. So I thank you very much for your attention. Sorry to run on so long. Happy to answer questions and I'm happy to stay here uh, as long as people are interested in having further con uh, conversation. It's been great to return uh, to the extension school. I haven't been teaching the last uh, uh, semester, uh, but I will be again in this coming semester and uh, glad to see uh, all of you out there. Oh, well, I cannot thank you enough. Um, what an amazingly comprehensive presentation you've put together. And I probably will lose some sleep over those unknown unknowns. <laughs> My goodness. Um, a number of the uh, past and current students of yours are, are giving you shout outs in chat. And I know you probably haven't had a minute to catch up with that, but um, there's been wonderful reflection in the chat and you know the sharing frustrations. And generally, there are a couple of questions related to uh, politicization of the process, division, uh, when the head of the CDC is a political appointee. Um, can you talk to any experience you've had working with governmental organizations and what it's been like, perhaps, over several administrations? Has it been a different approach? Well, I think the um, <clears throat> this is obviously a serious problem in the uh, uh, in the United States, the politicization of the response to COVID goes well beyond uh, disagreements about what the right thing to do is. Um, those kinds of disagreements are <clears throat> almost inevitable when you're facing a new threat and where um, it takes a good deal of time to develop scientific knowledge, to do the kind of uh, data collection that's required, uh, to do experiments with different therapeutic treatments, uh, and to uh, see those uh, uh, borne out uh, and to deal with the uh, tension between uh, developing, a, say, a vaccine that could potentially prevent the disease, uh, but where the uh, process of producing it and testing it and making sure that it's safe to use uh, has been compressed uh, given the uh, uh, prevalence of the disease and the death rate that uh, attach to it. So disagreements are certainly uh, likely, um, but making those disagreements into political issues, I think is something that we uh, would ideally uh, avo um, avoid, uh, perhaps inevitable in the uh, highly polarized political situation in the United States uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the uh, um, question of politicized professionals at the head of uh, different public agencies uh, is a complex one. Um, I think that, that it, there certainly is a long history of appointing uh, highly qualified professionals, whether they have a political identification or not, uh, to be in these positions. And um, they historically, meaning say over the last 20 years, Many of them have been willing to work in administrations that don't share the uh, D or R that they subscribe mm -hmm. to, uh, but they're willing to work in those settings. And um, uh, others of them have uh, have worked with particular candidates 
uh, and been political, but they've, uh, you know, helping to develop policy positions and, and other things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not competent professionals. Mm -hmm. I think the core of this is to, for those people, once they're in office, to be able to stand up to politicians who are trying to force them to take particular positions that are contrary to their professional expertise and their best mm -hmm. professional judgment. That doesn't mean they're right, but they should be able to stick to their guns or to acknowledge uncertainty. Um, they have to be willing to work with other people. Mm -hmm. And if they find themselves compromised in being able to do that, they should resign and resign not uh, passively and quietly, but resign mm -hmm. with statements about why they're resigning if it's the result of political mm -hmm. pressure. Right. Oh, couldn't agree more. Uh, now, you talk about uh, organizations and mobilizing uh, response um, plans through organizations. Have you had any experience or any any data points around religious organizations as a bridge, you know, a global unifier, perhaps uh, creating you know cohorts of support in spite of political division? Well, I think that um, I think religious institutions do have a role to play, and uh, and religions per se. Um, certainly, there is some uh, value to uh, people like uh, the Pope or the leaders of uh, other religious denominations uh, taking a stand, uh, say, recommending vaccination, which a number of them have done. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can have an influence on some people. Uh, although I think that uh, the kinds of decisions that people make about their behaviors, about mm -hmm. whether they wear masks, whether they're careful about social distancing, uh, whether they avoid, uh, for example, crowded uh, restaurants or mm -hmm. uh, bars or go to sporting events without protection. Religious, the religious organizations that are most likely to be able to influence those behaviors are mm -hmm. in fact much closer to the people involved. And um, uh, the people are, many people are strongly attached to their uh, uh, religious con uh, congregations. They trust mm -hmm. the people that belong, not only the leaders of those congregations, but the other people that they meet in those congregations. And so to the extent that they can be mobilized for positive uh, mm -hmm. support for public health measures, I think they can be quite helpful. Oh, that's great. Now, are there any glimmers of hope or bright spots that you see in spite of the state of today? Do you see any initiatives that are working well or partnerships that are emerging as a result of the chaos of now? I you know, I think there's a, a great deal of variation from one state to another. And I, uh, you know, reading the newspapers and spending the last year and a half sitting in my uh, my uh, kitchen or my, as I'm doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, not in the library, but sitting <laughs> at my dining room table for in reality, uh, I don't think I'm close enough uh, to doing that. And some of the normal ways that uh, I do learn about those things through giving executive education courses mm -hmm. at the Kennedy School, where we get assemble a lot of uh, leading professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. Those things have been canceled for, uh, or suspended temporarily. Mm -hmm. They'll go back uh, starting in 2022. So I don't have a lot mm -hmm. to say about that. And um, I think this is an area that will be ripe for lessons learned as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there has been some promise shared, say, by a professor of economics, Peter Marber, about, you know, the acceleration and digitization and, you know, all of the potential that exists as a result of this giant leap forward. You know, everyone needed to innovate, needed to, to upgrade, say. Um, I would say even having a virtual event like this is an incredible silver lining to the pandemic because it's just such a resource to our community. And, we would have had a harder time getting everyone who's in Malaysia and in uh, Hello Malaysia, Hello Singapore. Uh, you know, they're they're in chat, but they probably couldn't be here because of a barrier of time and distance. Right. I, you know, I think that's absolutely right, and I think we've seen it with the ability, say, of the Extension School to sustain its uh, course giving uh, mm -hmm. through remote means. Uh, certainly, that helps things. I think um, I know that at the uh, Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, the research center at the Kennedy School that I'm affiliated with, mm -hmm. uh, we have many seminars uh, and a typical seminar might get someplace between 20 or 150 people, depending mm -hmm. on the uh, potency of the topic and the generality of the topic to come to a, a seminar. 
uh, now that we've been doing them uh, over Zoom, um, the number and also recording them and posting them on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, the number of people exposed to those seminars has increased exponentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was uh, telling some of you earlier uh, this evening, um, with a colleague from the public health school, I did a seminar on uh, COVID very early in the COVID crisis for people in Nepal. And mm -hmm. we were utterly amazed. We sat in our respective houses and did this uh, 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 seminar with an interlocutor who was in mm -hmm. Kathmandu, Nepal. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the um, video uh, was ultimately read by, uh, was ultimately viewed by uh, about 17,000 people which was a factor of about uh, thousands of times more than we ever expected. We thought maybe 150 people uh, mm -hmm. under good conditions would see it, and yet it was seen by a lot of people. So I think uh, these kinds of things are going to be with us uh, long into the future, mm -hmm. and especially, I think, the ability of an institution like Harvard to project uh, the uh, many things that uh, its researchers and faculty uh, learn uh, out to a broader audience mm -hmm. uh, and one that can be uh, through the miracles of uh, these modern technologies uh, are people who can be uh, located thousands and thousands of miles away. I'm actually teaching mm -hmm. a course uh, at Tsinghua University in Beijing, mm -hmm. also from my mm -hmm. dining room table. And uh, I have students who are currently spread over 17 time zones, something that just mm -hmm. would have been impossible some years ago. So I, I'm um, amazed at what the, uh, the uh, technology can do. Well, that is wonderful to hear because there is a great deal of comfort in the questioning and in chat that you are shepherding this next generation of leaders who can help us you know, in the future and kind of in a sense, handing the baton right in time. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, your teaching at Harvard Extension School while we have you? I'd love to hear how that experience has been for you in time, because it has changed so much from when you began to where it is today. Just fascinating. Uh, yes, I think that's the case. Um, I started teaching in the Extension School in 1980, so I've been at it for about 40 years and have taught a variety of courses. Some of them were in the uh, uh, political science area, which is where my disciplinary training is. Uh, and I taught courses that were open to both graduates and undergraduates. And I think what I enjoyed most in that setting was um, the vast variety of students that I had. Sometimes it was pretty challenging. I remember one course mm -hmm. uh, where I had a student who was 18 years old and had never taken a college course before. He was on one side of the distribution in that classroom. And on the other side of the distribution uh, was a woman who was a full professor of nutrition at Tufts Medical School and a man who was the head of a, an architecture and construction company that was so innovative that Harvard Business School had written several case studies about uh, the innovations that his company had developed. And so I had a mm. brand new college student on one side and two incredibly uh, talented professionals on the other side. Um, and the extension school, I think, serves up those kinds of challenges to faculty, which I certainly mm -hmm. enjoyed. Uh, in recent years, I've taught in the management program and uh, uh, for a long time taught a course called Managing Organizational Change, uh, and mm -hmm. then started teaching courses on, uh, on uh, emergency preparedness and uh, another course on disaster relief which happens to be where I've been doing my research over the last, over the last uh, two decades. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had an incredible variety of students in that. Uh, one of them is uh, on the, I guess, uh, deeply involved in planning this uh, uh, seminar, uh, Liz Raditz. And uh, mm -hmm. there may be a few others out there in the uh, audience that I'm, I'm not aware of. Uh, I've had you know, quite a range of very capable people. Mm -hmm. Uh, that course is designed, I hope, to be able to speak in a thoughtful way uh, to people who are professionals in that field or aspiring professionals in that field, as Liz was at the time that she took the course. Um, but also, I hope to um, reach people who are simply going to be informed citizens, uh, because this is a fairly esoteric field. And uh, one, uh, I, I'm will make a bad joke by saying that I got into by accident, uh, but the um, uh, 
I found it both really interesting in terms of its substantive impact and very interesting uh, because of some of the intellectual issues that are involved in it. Because mm-hmm. unlike many government services where, say, take garbage collection, where mm-hmm. uh, trucks are out there you know, once a week or twice a week or whatever it is, they do this time after time after time. Uh, regular service delivery has one set of management issues. Uh, plant construction projects, we are building a highway, have a different set of uh, issues. If you work in a staff capacity and personnel or in budgeting uh, or in planning, there's yet another set of management problems. But emergency management is getting ready to do something that you may never actually have to do. But if mm-hmm. it happens, or when things like that happen, you need to be able to act as close to instantaneously as possible and do it under circumstances uh, where people's lives uh, and uh, welfare are at stake. And so the management problems are extremely different from what they are in almost any other public sector field. And I think that has been the intellectual mm-hmm. fascination for me. And I try to communicate that to my students. You have a tiny bit of, uh, in a very compressed form tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I hope that some of that uh, uh, curiosity about the uh, issues uh, gets transmitted to my mm-hmm. students. Yeah, it absolutely has. I mean, it's, you know, I can, I look back and chat and there is uh, one of your former students who took classes with you 20 years ago on tonight. So uh, Santiago from uh, Mexico, I feel like I need to speak your thanks, as well as Sunita in India, who also took your class and then implemented programs in her country of India. Just amazing. So the impact is there. And I will send you this transcript of chat So all of you who have dropped a note of support in or just cheers and good words, um, you know, Professor Howitt will see it. And also uh, this this recording is something that we hope that all of you will share. Uh, We will send it to you. We will post it on Harvard Extension School's YouTube channel. And, you know, again, it's it's an act of citizenry. Get it out there and and help mobilize leadership. Now before... Oh, go ahead. Don't want to interrupt. As I appreciate that, and um, I am happy to share the slides if uh, people would like, would like to Absolutely, have them. So if you yeah. have <laughs> some way to some way to post, at least inform the people who have signed mm-hmm. on to the uh, 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 the seminar to uh, access them. Absolutely, I, I would that would be terrific. I mean, I have a page of notes myself and I was taking photos of your slides for things to go back and, and research later. So that would be wonderful, thank you. Now, before we say goodbye, I wanna invite um, our Midwest chapter chair, Sol Gerard to jump in. She's our HEAA vice president as well. She just wants to say a quick thank you, Sol. Yes, absolutely. I want to thank Professor Howitt. Um, It has been absolutely a treat and a treasure to have you here tonight. You have inspired me. I have never taken your class, but um, I was taking pictures of the slides too. Mm -hmm. So I think I second the sentiment of a lot of people in the chat. Thank you so much, Professor Howitt, for supporting not just Um, our community at the Extension School for so, so many years, but also to be so supportive to our chapter. And um, it's truly amazing what you have been able to do and inspire. This seminar was inspiration for so many of us. I'm really thankful. Uh, You're very welcome. And I need to thank you and uh, uh, Jill and the others at the Extension School's uh, Alumni Relations Office for uh, inviting me to do this. And uh, it has definitely been a pleasure to do it. Uh, And uh, as I have indicated, the Extension School has been a big part of my life for quite a long time. And I very much value my association, uh, both with the students that I've had, but also with the uh, institution. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm happy to contribute in my small way to the uh, uh, to the mission. Your contribution uh, is valued so much more, and we look forward to the future. And I'm going to take one of your classes <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And also, I want to Better thank check with everybody. 
better check with Liz oh, to find out if I'm Liz to told me I not. must take the classes. <laughs> yeah. But um, I want to thank everybody from around the world. Argentina, Malaysia, Singapore. Um, we are so honored to be able to put this together uh, in between the HEAA Midwest chapter as well as the board and the Office of Advancement. And a really special thanks to Liz. Reddit. I know this is the chapter's effort, but without her, this wouldn't be possible. So yeah. thank you, Liz. And thank you, Jill and everybody. And thank you, everybody for attending. Yes, thank you all. Yes. Good night, yeah. everyone. With that, we and shall stay adjourn. Safe. Yes, stay safe and help plan for the future of everyone's safety. My goodness. <laughs> thank you, Professor Howitt. Please um, come back and, and keep us updated on what you're doing because I, I can only help hope and pray that you are informing our world leaders uh, with every passing day because there's so much um, that could happen in the future. But in the meantime, um, all of you, please come back, join us again uh, for more conversations on these types of urgent topics and let us know uh, what we can do to help you where you are in the world. All right, thanks everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you night. for coming. Bye.